times like these, we feel gratitude for coming together during an extraordinary crisis, showing that tough times bring out our best. Rebuilding Connecticut together. A message from CBIA. At Eversource, we are reducing the use of fossil fuels, committing to have operations be carbon neutral by 2030, building a smarter grid that can store energy until it's needed, protecting our environment, and developing energy supply plans for the future. All for you. That's why Eversource has been named the most responsible energy company in America. Eversource, our future is clean energy. Listen, I can't go into this IPO blindly. How do we make sure we're ready to meet all regulatory requirements? Chris? That is a great question. Steve? It's an important question. Tyler? I'd even say a critical question. Paul? I agree with Tyler. Terrific. Glad I asked. We need to ask Markham. I so yeah, was just telling him that. You can tell you. You. Ever wonder where the people with all the answers get all the answers? Ask Markham, accountants and advisors. You know, the restaurants probably were the ones that we worried about the most. Our first steps were to assist the local restaurants by waiving some of the zoning regulations regarding the um, establishment of outdoor dining on sidewalks uh, or within their parking lot. We eliminated permitting fees, parking fees, and even temporary signage regulations. One of the things that we were particularly proud of was establishing or working with business champions that would promote their favorite restaurant or a local business on social media. Good morning, everyone. We're gonna get started. It is so great to hear the buzz in this room. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Deepentima, the president and CEO of CBIA, and I am also the person who broke the escalator that goes downstairs. <laughs> so if you need to leave for any reason, which we don't want you to, uh, please use the uh, elevator out to the right. So welcome to the 2021 edition of CBIA's The Connecticut Economy Conference. As many of you know, we'll be re releasing the results of our uh, Markham uh, survey in a few minutes, and so I have uh, a simple survey question for you all. Where the hell have you been the last 18 months? It is great to see everyone. I've heard several times this morning how awesome it is to be in person. Hugs and kisses were flying around the room, a little fist pumps here and there. Um, you know, it was really important for us to get back in person. Uh, our last in-person event was March of 2020. And for those, those of you who may remember the January economic uh, summit uh, where we had uh, the Boston Fed here, uh, our keynote speaker said, 2020 looks great as long as there's not some major catastrophe. <laughs> well, we had a, a major catastrophe and, um, and we're powering through it. So we felt it really important to get back in person. But I will tell you, I did feel a little bit like Tom Hanks in Castaway for the past 12 months at our meetings, our virtual meetings, very isolated, very all by myself. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to be back in person with you all. I did have my own version of Wilson during this uh, past 13 months. Uh, my own Joe Brennan has been with me. <laughs> Joe and I would talk at each virtual meeting. He would tell me all the things I was doing bad. He wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. It was very challenging and difficult for me. Um, but now I have people here to laugh at my jokes and versus that very empty feeling. Uh, as I said, it's terrific to see all, all of you in person. I'm very grateful for the progress that we've make and made during this pandemic and for your all leadership during this time. It has been an unbelievable roller coaster ride. I'm sure we're not completely out of the woods yet, um, but it is great to be back in person. I want to thank our uh, sponsors for this event, uh, Markham LLP. Uh, you'll hear from Michael Broder in a little bit with the additional support of Eversource Energy, Liberty Bank, People's United Bank, Wells Fargo, and Windsor Federal Savings. I want to thank you all for your continued support of CBIA and our communities and for 
exemplifying the leadership roles that Connecticut businesses are playing as we rebuild the state's economy. One thing that we tried to do very hard at CBI is focus and highlight the great things that you and your businesses have been doing as we've uh, worked our way through this pandemic. As I mentioned, Markham has again collaborated with CBIA on this year's annual survey of Connecticut businesses, and we're very appreciative of that partnership. We'll, we'll release the survey findings later this morning with Markham's Michael Broder and a panel of business leaders breaking down the findings and sharing their experience for the past year. The survey really echoes the voices of Connecticut small businesses, which is the backbone of the state's economy, making up 99% of all companies in Connecticut. Those firms employ almost half of the state's workforce and account for 46% of Connecticut's 16 billion with a B plus in annual exports. The pandemic has only added to the challenges already faced by these small businesses. They're the ones that struggle the most through the past 18 months and have the most to lose if we do not effectively manage this recovery. We'll be hearing today from a group of Connecticut's mayors about the ways they supported their local businesses amid the pandemic and related to lockdowns and restrictions. And most importantly, they'll share their strategies for recovering Main Street, Connecticut. Here's a preview of what we'll see from the mayors. Well, when you think about the community development, so many of our Stratford businesses are very generous to our charities and our nonprofits. So they were also in this whole loop of maybe not having a reduced workforce, needing a food source because we had a, a lot of food insecurities. So we knew that people not only needed money, but they might need just the staples of how to how to get by until the grant money for our unemployment was, was flowing. We got reacquainted with our natural assets in our communities because we couldn't travel, we couldn't go on vacation. So you had to figure out what was fun and what was kind of cool to do in your own hometown or in your region. I'm looking forward to hearing from Mayor Laura Hoydeck, Torrington's Eleanor Carbone, West Hartford Sherry Cantor, Groton Mayor Keith Hedrick, and State Representative Christine Gupel at 945. As with our state, Connecticut small businesses represent the core of CBIA's DNA making up 95% of our membership for employers with under 100 employees. 70% of our membership is employers with less than 25 employees, which is the average size business in Connecticut. The needs of these small employers, employers drove our advocacy efforts at the state capitol again this year, a session where we called on bipartisan solutions for rebuilding Connecticut, for a change in thinking, for real collaboration so we can capitalize on our many strengths here in our great state. Listen, overall, the 2020 legislative session delivered a strong platform for rebuilding the state's economy. From the state budget with no broad-based tax increases, to significant targeted investments in our cities, workforce development, I know that's something critical in all your minds, child care, and historic unemployment reforms. The session addressed many of our rebuilding Connecticut policy priorities. Those recommendations were developed as a blueprint for addressing the critical issues impacting the recovery. The state's competitiveness and the critical need to continue to support our small businesses. We didn't win everything. To be sure, there were certainly some disappointments in the session and we'll continue to fight to get rid of the temporary corporate tax surcharge, to repeal the capital base tax, to exempt personal protective equipment and workforce training from the sales tax, to expand the apprenticeship training tax credit and restore the pass-through entity tax credit. I cannot highlight enough the work of our CBA advocacy team this year. Here are some incredible numbers. The team spent 5,800 hours lobbying at the 2021 session, 5,800 hours. We attended 115 public hearings. We testified on more than 100 bills. Not all of them were great bills. Their work saw the passage of 23 positive bills and the defeat of almost 80 anti-competitive measures. We played some offense. We played a lot of defense at the Capitol. We'd like to continue to flip that script and play more and more offense as we recover from, our, from the pandemic. 
In all, we calculate the effort that the state capital saved Connecticut employers $843 per employee in annual cost. That's a phenomenal return on investment for CBIA members. And it really strengthens our position at CBIA as a leading voice for you all, for the business community, for our employers. So our, policies for pri our policy priorities for this coming legislative session are being developed now. They're shaped by conversation with CBIA member companies, many of you in this room, as well as the results of this year's business survey that you'll hear about. The key areas we will focus on this coming session, clearly the labor shortage that we hear so much about. It's having too great an impact on our recovery. Also reducing the cost of doing business in Connecticut and making the state more affordable for everyone. It will take real collaboration between the public and private sectors and educational institutions to address the workforce issue in a holistic way. The Governor's Workforce Council is helping shape policymaking, including the creation of the Office of Workforce Strategy and additional funding for new and existing programs. Advanced CT has just launched a Campus Connecticut initiative designed to keep graduates here in our great state. You can learn more about that at their table in the lobby right around the corner. CBI's Ready CT affiliate is also managing a growing number of important workforce development programs, connecting businesses with our educators in a meaningful way. And businesses aren't sitting still either. Kudos to Stanley Black & Decker, who announced this month a five-year, $25 million global effort to fund manufacturing, construction, industry, vocational training, and reskilling programs. One of many employers in our state who are putting their money where their mouth is. I remain optimistic about our state's future, and that optimism is shared by more than 600 business leaders who responded to our survey this year. Their optimism is no doubt marked by caution. The recovery faces many challenges, but it's clear that the resiliency and innovation and the spirit that we've marked in the past response to the pandemic has moved our state forward and given us great reason for optimism. The pandemic changed everything, transforming the ways we look at our systems, our business models, our consumer behavior, careers, and the workplace. The opportunities for the state's economy, job growth, and communities are vast. Nonetheless, we must continue working together, and policymakers must amplify their commitment to rebuilding Connecticut better and stronger than ever. Eversource Energy Joe Nolan, who took over the lead role at New England's largest utility in May this year, is our keynote speaker today. We had to find someone with less tenure than me, so we brought in Joe from Boston. We've asked Joe to address the future of energy, a small topic for all of us, including Eversource joint offshore wind venture with Danish company Orsted a massive project that will deliver jobs, economic growth, and renewable energy. Markham's Michael Broder is here to introduce Joe. Michael, come on up. Welcome and thank you for your support of CBIA. Unfortunately, I need to wear glasses on like Chris, so sorry about that. So uh, thanks, Chris, uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to introduce Joe. Um, greatly appreciate that. Uh, as he mentioned, I am looking forward to sharing the survey results today. Uh, we have a great diverse panel, um, large business, small business, entrepreneurs, startup, uh, startup entrepreneurs, to talk about the Connecticut business climate. Um, I think it's going to be exciting. Um, although Chris kind of uh, spoiled some of, the, some of the key highlights of it, that's okay, we'll still get into it. Um, if you recall, last year we had the business survey. Um, if you were logged on virtually, we were relying on technology, and um, you know my technology kind of didn't work, it shut off, and I got um, disconnected and had to kind of scramble to get reconnected. So what did I do this year? I put all my notes on technology again. Um, I haven't learned my lesson, but hopefully my iPad, I, I did charge it last night, so I'll, I should be good. Um, you know, it is a new environment we're in. This is great to see people back together again. 
um, you know, things you didn't do two years ago when we had this event. Um, you didn't go to eye cleanse and clean your iPhone and get disinfected. You didn't uh, sanitize your hands and after you shook hands with everyone that you've known for the last 20 years. So a lot of things have changed, and I think we'll see that. And I think we'll hear some of that in the panel as well. Um, so enough about that. Let me introduce Joe. It's my pleasure to introduce Joe Nolan, President and Chief Executive Officer of Eversource Energy, New England's largest utility. Joe is a member of Eversource's Board of Trustees and joined Eversource in 1985, serving in various customer service government affairs positions before becoming Vice President of Government Affairs in 1999. In addition to his Eversource responsibility, Joe serves as Chairman of the Council of the Boston Children's Hospital, on the Board of Directors of the New England Council, Santa Maria Skilled Nur Nursing Facility, the Francis O'Met Scholarship Fund, the Camp Harbor View Foundation, and the Long Island Association, and serves the advisory board of the Intercontinental Real Estate Corporation. Good morning and welcome, Joe, and thank you for the presentation today. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Take that with me right there. Good morning, everybody. It is just so uh, wonderful to be here uh, when it's not a violent uh, tropical storm or a hurricane. Uh, it's been very lonely past 2021. This has actually been my home right here. You're actually in my living room. Uh, and I have spent a great deal of time uh, as we talked about how many days you should prepare uh, for, uh, for power outage. But fortunately, we were blessed uh, and we were able to dodge uh, what would have been the most significant and violent storm uh, that occurred since I joined uh, the little Boston Edison Company in 1985 was Hurricane Gloria. Everything was lining up to be that, that bad, uh, but uh, we were blessed and, and, and we dodged it. So uh, let me get started. I just want to uh, I thank uh, Chris and I want to thank Michael uh, for having me here this morning. Uh, it is wonderful to be here in Hartford. I know many of you probably went to the Jonas Brothers last night. They were at Xfinity Theater. I know that Senator Needleman was there, Norm Needleman, uh, and he spent the night uh, there seeing the Jonas Brothers. So uh, the place was bumping last night. I was at Max's, and you couldn't get in there. There were many uh, wonderful mothers taking their children there, and uh, I just cringed being the father of four daughters. I couldn't even imagine what they're going through. Uh, but I actually commended all of them, and uh, it, was, it was great to see. So, um, you know, Connecticut, Connecticut continues to be an integral part of, uh, of Eversource. We have 4,500 employees, you know, 1,700 contractors here supporting, you know, our electric, gas, and water operations for our customers throughout Connecticut. We pay uh, over $259 million in property taxes, $175 million in gross earnings tax, and we give more than $2 million a year to Connecticut charitable organizations. Connecticut means a lot to us, and I'm hopeful we mean something to Connecticut as well. I appreciate the chance to discuss our contributions to the state's economy as well as energy-related issues that will help shape the economy in the future. Next slide, please, Alan. I'd also like to highlight one of Eversource's major contributions to this region's economy that's coming up in just over a week. On October 9th, the Eversource Hartford Marathon and the associated races will take place in a hybrid format, both in person and virtual. Some of the runners will, right, will run right down Main Street, while others will be, take part of it in their own neighborhoods. Eversource became the title sponsor of the marathon in 2014. This signature event for the city had lost its previous sponsor and was in jeopardy. I knew how much the event means to Hartford and to the state of Connecticut and to the communities that benefit from the uh, funds that come from this marathon. So with the COVID requirements, you know, included many safety precautions, uh, we had to, uh, we had to kind of change it up a little bit. You know, Beth Sluger, at the Marathon Foundation has been a great partner of ours, and uh, I, can't, I can't say enough about Beth. I was hoping to see her this morning. She always seems to, to find me when I show up here in Connecticut, so it's wonderful. 
uh, and you know, all of the worthy cha charities that have benefited from the foundation. You know, since 2014, the total economic impact to the greater Hartford region is more than $81 million and has raised and supported many, many charities. We're all proud of the sponsorships in all of the businesses and individual organizations that it's benefited. I invite you to join us this year. Online registration will be open until October 6th, so if anyone here is in shape for 26.2 miles or even just a 5K run, please sign up. Or if you're like me and you prefer to have more of a supportive role, feel free to come to the uh, finish line and cheer it on. I will be there uh, holding, the, holding the strip there for the winner when they run through. You know, we've been a sponsor uh, also for uh, the Special Olympics for over 30 years. Uh, you know, it's funny, even uh, we've been making snow in Windsor. I mean, what type, of, what type of a utility are we making snow? Usually we're trying to dodge it, but uh, we have made, been making snow the, uh, uh, every single year to allow our Olympians uh, to go cross-country skiing uh, and watch these amazing athletes perform, which has been really very, very touching. Uh, you know, in addition, you know, we have a close connection to the Travelers Championship. I had the pleasure of this year of being able to play in it, and I've had the benefit of playing in it for the past several years. And it's really quite an event and huge, huge economic driver here in the state. But we also sponsor the PGA Player Experience for the junior golfers, a program that lets young athletes play with some of the pros in this, in this significantly, uh, a significant event in here in Connecticut. These events have been postponed, unfortunately, uh, due to COVID but we look forward to a return in person next year. You know, I'd like to shift now to a different marathon where Eversource is leading the pack. I'm referring to the development of offshore wind, which will help drive the clean energy future and provide an economic boost for Connecticut and New England. This is a major initiative for Eversource that has the possibility to become not only a new source of clean energy, but a brand new job creating industry to boot. And Connecticut is at the center of these exciting developments. The Lamont administration has set a clear expectation that the state's electric sector will be 100% carbon free by 2040. That's only 19 years away, which isn't, a, which isn't that long at all when you consider the extensive work that needs to be done. Remember too, that Connecticut has a goal to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. That's just around the corner as well. The good news is that offshore wind is gaining momentum and coming into its own as a major part of the clean energy future and Connecticut is well positioned to take advantage of both renewable energy and job creation. Eversource is at the forefront of offshore wind development on the East Coast through our joint venture partnership with Orsted. We bring expertise with regard to the electric network in the region, while Orsted brings the experience of offshore wind development. The joint venture has state contracts to provide more than 1,700 megawatts of capacity. This includes 300 megawatts to the state of Connecticut from our Revolution Wind Project. Which, was also, which, which also provides 400 megawatts to our neighbors in Rhode Island. I'd like to share some images and facts to give you a better picture of offshore wind farms. Has anyone ever seen an offshore wind farm up close? That's what I guessed. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see that. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. So we're going to give you a sneak preview of, uh, of what's to come here. Just to give you a sense, you know, the turbines we install in these wind farms will be up to 870 feet tall at the blade, tip to tip. That's one and a half times the height of the Traveler's Tower here in Hartford, and twice the height of the Statue of Liberty. Think about the jobs that we'll create, the manufacturing, the steel monopiles, fiberglass blades, vessel development, shipping and installing all the commerce in our ports, Connecticut, in the Northeast states are leading the way in creating new clean energy industry for the United States and harnessing this incredible economic development opportunity for the region. Revolution winds turbines will be virtually imperceptible to the naked eye from areas in Connecticut 
Our modeling shows that only the blade tips would potentially be visible from points in Connecticut. Due to the curvature of the earth and the distance from the project, other parts of the turbine will be unnoticeable. Eversource and Orsted have leased offshore areas with a capacity for 4,000 megawatt hours of power. Once fully developed, our lease areas will be able to power around 2 million homes with clean and affordable energy. We will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 6 million tons, equivalent to removing more than a million cars from the road. States in New England and the Mid-Atlantic see the value of offshore wind and are issuing more solicitations for supply. Our joint venture is carefully assessing each opportunity and we see plenty of room for growth. Here in Connecticut, the state has authorized the purchase of 1.2 gigawatts of offshore wind and has contracted for about half so far. Connecticut's support for offshore wind underlines a key point. The state needs to be in a positive, forward-looking place to do business if the economy is to grow. It's not enough to have companies in any industry that have great innovative products. State policy needs to support growth as well. We are making real and significant progress on offshore wind and to benefit the entire region. Here in Connecticut, we are forging a partnership with local companies. We've also announced partnerships with the Mystic Aquarium, Project Oceanology, and Niantic Children's Museum to support research, STEM programming, and career resources. This interest at the state level is being supported by new momentum at the federal level. The Biden administration has proven its support for offshore wind by streamlining the project review process. We expect final federal review approval of Revolution Wind in the third quarter of 2023. We are currently looking at commercial operation at 2025. In terms of the economic impact of Revolution Wind, it's going to provide over 400 jobs during construction and about 100 new permanent offshore wind jobs. The development of offshore wind requires onshore support facilities, and we are working to build a facility here in Connecticut that will rival any other on the East Coast. Eversource has entered a private partnership, a public-private partnership to redevelop the underutilized New London State Pier into a vibrant hub for offshore wind turbine staging and assembly. This is a rendering of the facility once it's constructed and completed. I will tell you that uh, I have a great relationship with Mayor Passaro. I hold him in very high regard, and I was communicating with him yesterday, and I get regular updates on the progress. And folks that go by that pier, if you take a look, you will see a significant amount of earth moving and uh, other activities that are taking place. And, you know, we're, we're very, very excited about it. That port right there in New London uh, is the only deep water heavy lift port uh, really uh, all the way down to Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, there are no overhead obstructions, and it's, it provides a competitive advantage to us uh, that no other offshore wind developer has. The location also offers convenient access to our lease areas, which are 70 miles uh, from, that, uh, from that port, which reduces the travel time uh, and the cost of construction. The Eversource Orsted Joint Venture is investing $77.5 million into the redevelopment and nearly $100 million uh, when you take the lease payments into account. The project will create more than 450 construction jobs in dozens of long-term positions. The redevelopment of State Pier will support the Eversource Orsted use of the first American-made wind turbine installation vessel. This vessel is costing $500 million. And just to give you a, a sense of scale, the vessel is over 500 feet long. It's about 148 feet wide. Uh, it is extraordinary. You can come into port uh, and take six wind turbine assemblings. And we are going to be the first user of that uh, vessel when it, when it is completed. It's being constructed right now. It will be the first American-made, uh, it's called Jones Act vessel. It's right now in Brownsville, Texas, uh, and it's, it's really, uh, really pretty extraordinary. So this, this type of a vessel creates considerable efficiencies when in use. Now in the future, a project is creating activity in New London, Connecticut, 
for businesses, and we feel that it will also create a number of other uh, businesses that will locate there. You know, State Pier will serve as an epicenter for additional wind development if the state supports investment. The pier will also be able to attract a new range of industries and new classes of cargo. Construction is underway and we're pleased to have a very positive supportive relationship with that city in the, as the future takes shape. Offshore wind will be the foundational part of the clean energy future, but it's far from the only part. Eversource is innovating in other ways as well. We've invested $55 million to enable the development of electric vehicle charges in Massachusetts, including a substantial percentage in environmental justice communities. Earlier this year, Pura issued a decision as part of its grid modernization effort to establish a statewide zero emissions electric vehicle program. In support of that decision, we're expanding our EV efforts to Connecticut, and we expect to invest an additional $250 million across the state in the coming years. We're supporting the creation of a charging network that will help make electric vehicles an attractive and convenient option for drivers throughout New England. Legislation in Connecticut also encourages the development of energy storage systems. Eversource has a storage project in Massachusetts, and we are aiming to bring one online very soon and like to do the same here in Connecticut. You know, I've personally met with folks at Cardoza Energy down in Danbury. Cadenza, I'm sorry, Cadenza Innovation. And they are a battery storage company uh, that's located in, in Danbury that has some proprietary technology around battery storage. And we're very, very excited about uh, the prospects of that company uh, and what it will do for, uh, for the state of Connecticut as well as the storage industry as a whole. They are breaking new ground. There's a saying in my business that the cleanest energy is the energy you don't use. As we work to make our energy cleaner and more renewable, we're also focused on helping our customers use less of it. Our nationally recognized energy efficiency programs represent an annual investment of more than $600 million across our three states. They're helping customers all over Connecticut save energy and money or reducing their emissions. For example, earlier this year, we worked with the owners of Hartford's famous gold building to make improvements that will save 870,000 kilowatt hours of energy per year, or $140,000 in energy costs. These improvements reduce the same amount of carbon emissions as taking 150 cars off the road. Axel International, a specialty manufacturer of cables and wires, will save about a million dollars in energy costs over 10 years at a new facility. We're helping the town of Greenwich make lighting and other improvements that will save more than 3.3 million kilowatt hours of energy per year. More than 757,000 Connecticut customers received energy efficiency rebates or services from us in 2020. Projects completed in 2020 are estimated to save customers a combined $52 million a year and close to $582 million over the lifetime of the improvements. Projects completed in 2020 are also estimated to save 93,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. That's equivalent to 18,000 cars coming off the road. Our programs help make Connecticut a better and more desirable place to live and work. I'll quickly mention, too, that Eversource supports our main streets through direct investments that promote redevelopment. We purchase tax credits to support low income and support housing projects. We purchase historic tax credits, which support renovation of abandoned factories, mills, and other buildings to turn them into housing and business units. By purchasing these tax credits, we're helping Connecticut communities develop housing and get these properties back on the tax rolls. Connecticut's economy and quality of life depends on reliable electric and gas delivery. We plan to invest more than $3 billion in our infrastructure this year across our three states, making our grid more reliable and resilient. Our ability to keep our grid strong and resilient also relies on skilled workforce. While we don't face the same labor shortage issues as some other industries, 
we want to ensure that a strong supply of line workers and other field workers for the future. With this in mind, Eversource partnered with Capital Community College and the IBEW Local 420 and 457 to offer a new program that's developing the next generation of electrical line workers in Connecticut. Students complete an 11-week course including electrical theory, basic math, communications, CPR, and safety, all to prepare for good-paying, family-supporting employment in the electrical fields. This summer, I got a chance to meet the first 15 students taking part in this program. I was impressed by their energy, hard work, and commitment. I have faith that the future will be in good hands. Strong reliability also depends on vegetation management. Trees are the largest single source of outages and are especially damaging during storms. Our tree trimming programs are critical to ensuring safe and reliable power. We will invest $72 million in tree work across Connecticut in 2021 to fortify our electric distribution system against extreme weather. Following Tropical Storm Henri, we reached out to 19 communities that were hottest hit. We asked for their partnership to address hazardous trees and branches before they caused outages and safety issues. We also partnered with Connecticut Notable Tree Committee and the Tree Wardens Association of Connecticut to perform health checkups and trims on some of the state's largest and historic trees near power lines. Keep in mind that some tree work requires the permission of property owners, and we don't always get it. When a property owner refuses permission to trim or cut trees, that hurts reliability for everybody on that circuit. If we come to your business or to your home or your organization and ask permission to, to do tree work, I hope you'll consider it. It supports stronger service for you and for your neighbors. While I'm on the subject of storms, I'll add that we rely on small businesses to support our storm restoration efforts. At the peak of our response to Tropical Storm Andre in August, we had more than 2,000 repair crews in Connecticut, plus thousands of people working behind the scenes. We booked more than 5,000 hotel rooms and bought thousands of meals to house and feed our team over the course of several days. We very much appreciated the businesses that provided the necessary services to keep our storm response moving forward. You should also know that we're not just maintaining the electric grid, we're also modernizing it. For instance, we've installed smart switches that allow grid operators to remotely route power outages, restoring customers fastest, faster. We're installing stronger poles and wires as well. Grid modernization has been the focus at Pura for several years, and we are actively involved in all related dockets. I've already mentioned our investment in electric vehicle charging. We've also submitted pro proposals for advanced metering infrastructure, which helps customers manage their energy use. We look forward to working with Pura on these new technology initiatives. As we look towards the Connecticut future, we face some challenging energy decisions. As storms become more frequent and more severe, we will continue to invest and, and, per, and preserve the reliability, resiliency, and redundancy of our energy delivery networks. Climate change is real, and it's having a real effect. We also have to make decisions on energy infrastructure to enable a clean energy future. As we add renewable energy to the grid, we'll need more high-voltage transmission lines to bring the energy from the places where it's generated to the population centers. Transmission lines are not always popular, but they are necessary to enable increased usage of renewable power. Speaking of fossil fuels, we expect a discussion on the future of natural gas as an energy source as we move to increase renewables and reduce emissions. Eversource delivers natural gas to 246,000 customers across Connecticut. We see gas as a bridge to the clean energy future. It has already served the region well. A shift from coal to natural gas as a primary source of energy has helped reduce emissions from generation by 40 percent since 1990. We support emissions reductions for the future 
of our planet. At the same time, we will have to carefully manage any transition to other energy sources to ensure reliable service to our customers. This process will require close collaboration with Pura and other key stakeholders. And amid all this challenge and change, we recognize that affordability is an ongoing issue. We know that Connecticut has relatively high energy costs and that the pandemic has caused some customers to struggle. The investments we need to make in our energy future will need to be prudent and well managed so we can limit their impact on customers as much as possible. Again, we're committed to working through this with Pura and others. Individually and as a group, all of us here need to support productive state-level action. I said earlier that having forward-looking companies in Connecticut is not enough. Policies and regulations need to encourage growth and innovation. We all have to do our part to help Connecticut meet its clean energy goals. No matter how the future develops, Eversource is committed to providing safe, reliable energy to the state of Connecticut. Our work to innovate in offshore wind and other technologies is shaping our clean energy future. We know our customers depend on us, and we take our role very seriously and are focused on continually improving our service. I personally have a deep roots in customer service. That's where I began my career 36 years ago. And I've never lost sight of the impacts that we have on our customers. On that note, I want to thank everybody for listening to me this morning. I'm hoping to see you all at the marathon, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Questions for Joe? Don't be shy. I think we've got folks running around the room with the microphone. Yes. Mr. Purcell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, first of all, I'm a Massachusetts native. I've uh, been here in Connecticut for 20 years. I want to thank you for your accessibility here in the state. I've read many of your thoughtful op-ed pieces. Uh, you've been uh, uh, available to the press, and we appreciate it a, very, a great deal. Thank you. Um, I have uh, two questions. First, uh, from, with your background in government affairs, as I'm listening to NPR on the way up uh, today, you know, this is a big day in Washington. We're dealing with the continuing resolution. Can we keep government open? Uh, the debt ceiling, and then, of course, the infrastructure bill, as well as the bill better. Um, there was some discussion on NPR this morning about um, the utilities across the country and the response. Uh, their ability to meet the um, uh, provisions, these climate uh, change provisions, and to maintain the rate structure. So I wonder if you might comment on that. And certainly, we're, you're, we're way ahead here, obviously, based on your presentation. And then secondly, if you could talk about your divers diversification strategy, you're in the water business now. Uh, you're on the Aquarium Water Company. Uh, maybe you can talk about that as well. Thank sure. you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Great question. So we'll let's just talk about um, affordability. Let's talk about some of the opportunities we see in Washington uh, right now in this bill. I mean, if we could get some tax credits around uh, the transmission or uh, our infrastructure that would allow us to bring about additional renewable energy to the region. You know, I'll tell you that I've been involved with some folks here in Connecticut as we try to pitch businesses to come here. And, you know, it always troubles me when I hear folks say, well, gee, you know, we can go to Texas, we can get it for two cents, and we can go here. And, and what I say to these folks is, listen, if you want to get cheap, dirty power that's unreliable, we are not the place for you. You know, we've got tremendous reliability. You can go to bed at night knowing you've got the cleanest kilowatt hour probably in the country right now, and we are way ahead of all this. So what I think could take place for us in Washington is if we get some more incentives uh, around some tax treatment for investments around clean energy, and that's only going to help us make it more affordable here for our customers. And that's really what we strive for every day uh, is affordability. And all the investments that we make in transmission, what we're doing is this is to avoid uh, you know, some costly congestion on the grid. So that's, that's what we do. You know, water, it's funny. I've been in this business for 36 years, and water was right under our nose, and I only wish that we got there sooner. Uh, you know, water's a great business. I, if you think about it, we're in all the same cities and towns. We're dealing with all the same elected appointed officials. We're dealing with the same regulator, uh, and it's, uh, it's great. It's also a critical, uh, critical service that we provide to our customers. I mean, water, you got gas. 
and you have electricity. So uh, it's, it, it is a natural for us uh, operating in these cities and towns and the infrastructure that's in the ground. So that's really what it was all about. And I think it's funny, um, I have a very good friend of mine that's at Con Ed and they can't believe, you know, they never talked about water in their boardroom. And all of a sudden after we did the transaction, everyone's talking about, everyone in the electric business is talking about water in the boardroom. So uh, it's, it's very, very exciting. And we think we, um, we think we have great expertise in that space. And uh, we were happy to take that. That was an asset. Aquarium Water actually was owned by a, a Canadian pension fund. And how great is that to take it and, and bring it right back here and re-Americanize those assets and right here in Connecticut. And that's where it's based. And uh, we're really proud of that asset. So, uh, so it was great. Any other softball questions for me? I don't want to, I don't want that Norm Needleman asking me any tough ones there, so. No, he, yes. he, he was sitting right here, but he took yeah. all, there he is, there okay. he is. Yeah. Good morning, Joe. Jeff Puglis, Middlesex County Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank you for your comments this morning. And I'm wondering if you can expand on your comments dealing with community support, your community support initiatives throughout the state. My organization has certainly been a beneficiary. I know many in this room have. But your vision from the CEO spot and the company's vision moving forward, you know, what community enhancements have you made on the community support side, and where do you see that moving forward? I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. You know, one of the goals that I've always had, and it's something, it's really a business I grew up in, is, is to be really a part of the, uh, the fabric of the community. So we're looking for organizations that are actually delivering. We just don't want to get, send our money somewhere and not really understand where it's going, and that's what we really dial in. And, and that's why you see us play a very active role. Not only are we giving money, but you'll see our you know, 4,500 employees that live in the state that will take a part in that. I mean, we have volunteer initiatives and uh, things that are taking place in communities that are oversubscribed. We have to, we just can't have that many folks go because we got to keep, obviously, keep the lights on, the water running, and the gas flowing every day. So um, what you get with Eversource is you get more than just money. Uh, you get a partnership and you get a commitment uh, from all of our employees, uh, from, right from me all the way down, and, and I'm out there doing a number of these events, and uh, I'm just really, really proud of it. So that's what takes place. Anybody else? More questions for Joe? Joe, I, I, got, I got one. You've commented about renewable energy and the cost that comes with renewable. Do we ever get to a point where renewable energy hits such a scale where it actually starts to lower our electricity costs or energy costs? You know, I think as we begin to get some mandates federally around uh, carbon taxes and things like that, um, you know, you take a state like Connecticut that's further down the road, is already clean. Uh, we're seeing prices uh, for, uh, for wind uh, drop significantly. I think the opportunities, uh, what Connecticut has for whether it's fuel cells or storage, uh, right here, I mean, it's, these things are being developed here. And that's like, storage is a critical component of any type of a renewable. I mean, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And that's why you need to integrate uh, both the storage along with some of the renewable products. And I, I do see an opportunity where you could get to a point where, uh, well, I mean, it's going to get too costly, quite frankly, for fossil fuels. It, it's going to be, uh, they're going to be shut down at, at some point. And I think that we are so far up now uh, in terms of our investments in clean energy that we're going to have a competitive advantage uh, from the folks that have been uh, big polluters, you know, whether it's coal or whether it's oil. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not good. And uh, they've been continuing it. And uh, we've probably lost a lot of businesses that have decided to go there because of energy prices. But I think the folks that have gone to Texas after what took place down there and the lack of reliability, they have to think long and hard. You know, what is it like to go 10 days without any power and lose, your, you know, lose a lot of equipment in a plant? And that doesn't happen here in this region. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, Millstone, Millstone is, a critical, uh, is a critical resource for New England. Uh, you know, we've always felt that. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the dif difficult matters that I think for Millstone is that, you know, the customers in Connecticut bore the brunt of that. And that really should have been something that should have spread across New England because that is an asset that benefits everybody in New England. Uh, and unfortunately, it, that's not how it played out. But I will tell you, it's a, it's a key piece of our uh, energy portfolio and something that, you know, we're, we're very pleased to have base load uh, nuclear generation in the region that can 
augment uh, any other uh, resource. It's, it's a solid asset. So, uh, you know, we hope that that asset will continue. Um, yeah, as you know, we have a 10-year contract uh, that provides, you know, there is much of uh, a job creator and tax player that's ever, ever sourced. So it's, um, it's kind of a win-win at that point. So I see, you know, as long as that can continue to go, I think, it's, uh, I think it has great, great promise. Other questions? Joe, you're, you're a Canton guy. We like Canton this. We've got the distinguished senator in the room here, but what can the Connecticut policymakers do to help lower the cost of energy? Well, you know, I think, um, I think unlocking as much opportunity in this renewable space uh, as possible. And I think that when you see the innovation that's taking place in Connecticut with technologies, um, you know, and that's really what I talked about that that Connecticut has a great opportunity. You look at what took place in this new London port. That new London port was significantly underutilized for quite some time. And to go in and make that investment in that port, uh, you're going to begin to see a significant amount of other businesses that are going to come there because they want to be a part. They want to be a part of this clean energy future. So I'm not just saying wind. I mean, this foundation installers, you're going to see um, assembly and fabricators, uh, you know, I talked about the storage company in Danbury. There are fuel cell companies. Uh, we're really, uh, this Connecticut is on the edge of really being the leader in clean energy. And so all that I would ask the policymakers is, you know, roll out the red carpet. These are the types of jobs that you want uh, in Connecticut. You know, they're, they're skilled jobs. They're well-paying. Um, they just need, they, they're in a fragile state right now. They're, they're very, very... Um, kind of immature, they'd be trying to come into their own. So help them and foster them and do what you can to, to give them a break, to get that runway, to be able to get up and running. And I'll tell you right now, we'll pay dividends. We'll be sitting here in, you know, five years from now and they'll say, wow, wow, Connecticut is, is really extraordinary when it comes to uh, this clean energy future and, and the reduction of carbon. Anybody else? Senator. <laughs> We knew he'd ask the question eventually. Of course, he told me. He told me yesterday he was bringing rotten tomatoes. I, I talked to him yesterday. <laughs> he was bringing rotten tomatoes, and I talked to the governor. The governor was very, very, uh, very nice to me yesterday. And you know, today's the first day that you can do sports betting, and the governor is such a gentleman. How he's going to bet? This is how edgy he is. He's going to bet on whether they shake hands, uh, the Patriots shake hands afterwards with the Bucks. That's that's how edgy he is. That's the bet he's taking today with the first bet place. So, Senator and, Needleman, and, my and, dear and friend. And I, I was not going to bring rotten tomatoes. I was going to bring real tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I do want to thank um, you for coming and speaking today, Joe. And uh, being that you mentioned my name a few times, I'm happy to say a couple of quick words. Um, uh, as most people in this room know, um, the legislature and the governor have been incredibly proactive on energy, uh, renewable energy, energy procurements. We are all trying to take a balanced approach between um, doing our part to mitigate climate change and carbon um, while we're managing costs. And as, uh, as Joe said, the cost of renewables are coming down. Um, today, the price of natural gas has been spiking um, so high that the cost of spot energy is actually almost on parity with Millstone now. So it's not really costing us extra money to have done that procurement. Um, but we, uh, we are walking a tightrope here because we know Connecticut is a high cost state for energy. I pay an awful lot in my business for energy, whereas I pay less in Michigan. But I am very committed to the fact as a business owner that um, you know probably spends a million dollars with these guys a year, that this is the right place to be because all states need to follow our lead. Um, but it is not an easy task. Uh, much as I've been a critic at times of the company for some of their communication and, and storm uh, performance, I think that uh, move to hire this young man right here has been an excellent move on the part of the company. He understands what communication is all about, and I think one of the failures in the past had been around communication, and he listens, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I so, love this guy. Hey, <laughs> not supposed to be that nice to you, Joe. Um, but no, seriously, company is working on making improvements where they need to. 
We're gonna work on the vegetation management piece this year. I think that it's really important for people to understand that as much as they love their trees, if you have electric wires and trees near them, um, you're gonna have a problem when there's a storm. And, and you can't have it both ways. You can't love your tree and then complain when you lose your power because the tree couldn't come down. So we're working together. The state is very forward thinking. The governor's forward thinking. We did uh, 2,000 megawatt procurement for wind energy that actually made all this possible. And we're doing, we did 1,000 megawatt procurement for battery storage. These are subsidized purchases initially because that's the only way to bring costs down. And as Joe said, I think that the country and the world needs to move towards pricing carbon efficiently so that we move in a direction of using less carbon-based fuels. And I think Eversource, State of Connecticut are in the lead on that. So thank you for coming today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Anybody else have really nice words to say about Joe Nolan? Joe, thanks very much Thank for being you here so today. Much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Great job. <laughs> Joe needs to go to the bathroom, so uh, we're going to take a break till 9:45, and then we'll come back and hear from uh, our mayors about what they're doing to rebuild uh, Main Street. So we'll give you a quick preview as we uh, head to break. See you back at 9:45. town actually just went ahead and bought the jersey you know we rented the jersey barriers and we we did all the configuration so we used public spaces on our streets to expand to have that outdoor dining and that really saved uh, so many restaurants uh, in throughout our town but largely in our center in blueback square and many of the restaurants said that they did better than they did the previous uh, summer because of that expanded dining obviously the seating, but also the experience. At Eversource, the cities and towns where we live are also where we work, and our commitment to them runs deep. More than just powering the local economy, since 2018, Eversource employees have volunteered close to 100,000 hours, and we've donated more than $67 million to local causes. It's one of the reasons why Eversource has been named the most responsible energy company in America.